You're the Archivist of the United States, and it's a special treat to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives for the latest in the series of the Nixon Legacy Forums that we co-sponsor with the Nixon Foundation. And a special greeting to our friends and the C-SPAN audience who are joining us from across the nation and around the world. It was President Franklin D. Roosevelt who started the presidential library system in 1939 by donating his personal and presidential papers to the government and pledging part of his estate at Hyde Park, New York, to house them. I'm always impressed and moved by the words FDR spoke at the dedication of his library there in June of 1941. I think of them as both a credo and a mission statement for all of the 13 presidential libraries currently in our National Archives system. President Roosevelt said, to bring together the records of the past and to house them into buildings where they will be preserved for the use of men and women in the future. A nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past. It must believe in the future. It must, above all, believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. The collection of papers and recordings and artifacts at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California are among the most extensive of any of our presidential libraries. They are and will be a source of education and instruction for citizens and scholars who strive to uncover the past as they seek to understand the future. It is fortunate that many of the men and women who worked in the Nixon administration are available today to revisit those momentous times four decades ago. They uniquely can bring the, the history of those times to life by telling the story, and no less important, the backstory of the events in which they participated and of the documents they created back in the day when they were working in the Nixon White House. The documents and tapes and other materials are all in the archives at Yorba Linda. The purpose of these Nixon legacy forums is to supply the human element behind those papers that can be so important for understanding how and why things really happened or happened the way they did. History's understanding of these events will be all the richer and deeper because of these forums, and we are grateful to the men and women who have agreed to participate in them. The Nixon leg legacy forums aren't and aren't intended to be the definitive histories of their topics. Rather, they are conversations that historians will assess and analyze as they pursue their studies. After some 30 forums dealing with domestic topics, this morning's forum is one of a new series devoted to President Nixon's foreign policy. Most recently, a panel, panel considered the historic opening to China. Today, the subject is the Paris Peace Accords that were signed on January 27, 1973. The Accords ended American involvement in Vietnam, and at least temporarily, they ended the fighting in that troubled land. Today, more than 40 years later, the Vietnam War, its origins, its conduct, its ending, and its legacy is still a subject of study and scrutiny and controversy. We and present and future historians are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear at first hand from some of these officials who were involved in the diplomatic aspects of that war. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Shepard, of the Nixon Foundation, who will introduce today's moderator, KT McFarland. Jeff. Thank you, David. Good morning. Uh, I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Richard Nixon Foundation, which co-sponsors these uh, legacy forms with the National Archives. It's a wonderful partnership. Uh, uh, David uh, is responsible for 12 billion documents, uh, some 43 million pages of which he's graciously placed at the Nixon Library in California, which is his facility. And uh, we, in our turn, have the people who created those documents. So if you're old enough to remember Warren Beatty in the movie Shampoo, we got the heads. And he's got the documents. And it's worked out to be a very, very happy partnership. And we've done over 30 of these, and I've had the pleasure of uh, helping produce them. Since my experience on Nixon's staff was on the domestic side, we've tend to favor topics that I knew. Uh, and that didn't include foreign affairs. Uh, but we've stumbled onto a, a brilliant and helpful counterpart of me uh, that is my pleasure to introduce, and that's KT McFarland. Uh, you know KT as, as Fox News national security analyst, but everybody has to start somewhere, 
and Kathy Troya started as a clerk typist on the graveyard shift of the National Security Council when she was a sophomore at George Washington University. Actually, I was a freshman. A freshman at George Washington <laughs> University. See, my facts are wrong already. Uh, and then she grew in stature and in importance under Nixon and President Ford and President Reagan, where she was a, a contributing substantive member of the National Security Council. And she has very kindly consented to moderate a series of these Nixon legacy forums on, uh, on foreign affairs topics. And in that particular series, this is our third one. Uh, so at this point, I'm very, very happy to introduce KT. And our topic today, Vietnam and the Paris Peace Accord. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And I, and I do want to add the thanks um, for all of us from the Nixon Kissinger National Security Council staff and foreign policy community of the importance of doing this. Um, the documents are one thing, but to actually hear from the people who made history, I think, is a great addition not only to the nation's knowledge, to the history, but to the next generation of Americans who are going to have to grapple sometimes with the very same issues. As Jeff pointed out, this is the third in a series devoted to the Nixon administration foreign policy. We've t covered several, the ones we've covered so far have been the Nixon Kissinger reorganization of the national security decision making structure, Middle East shuttle diplomacy, and the opening to China. The five years of the Nixon administration were a particularly fruitful time in American foreign policy, and many call this the golden age of American diplomacy. Uh, this one is going to focus on the Vietnam War, uh, negotiations, and the Paris Peace Accords. It was one of the biggest and most intractable problems that Nixon faced when he walked in the door and he took office. It is difficult today, in 2014, to comprehend how divisive the Vietnam War had become by the late 1960s. The country had already, was already on the edge uh, because of the two Kennedy and Martin Luther King assassinations. The Vietnam War exacerbated those tensions. And the draft meant that every family was affected. We had over half a million American troops halfway around the world in a war we couldn't seem to win, but we didn't know, know how to end. There were demonstrations on college campuses across the nation. Young men burnt their draft cards, risking prison and some fled to Canada to avoid going to war. As the war dragged on with no victory in sight, the anti-war sentiment swept across the country, dividing family and friends. Lyndon Johnson, who was the president, had no choice but to withdraw from re-election, and his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, ran in his stead, but could not escape the Vietnam legacy. So in November 1968, Richard Nixon became president and inherited a full-scale war in Southeast Asia. The Vietnam War went on to become one of the seminal events of the second half of the 20th century. Ultimately, 50,000 Americans lost their lives. It shaped a generation of military leaders and politicians. And joining us today are the men who made history. They were the key assistants to Henry Kissinger. They helped end the Vietnam War, and they hammered out the Paris Peace Accords. I want to introduce uh, first Richard Smizer. Professor Smizer served extensively in Germany with US Armed Forces in the, in the Foreign Service including as a witness to the Berlin crisis of 1961, the beginning of the Cold War. He was an advisor to the US delegation of the Paris Peace Talks in 1969 and became a senior member of Kissinger's National Security Council staff. He was responsible for Vietnam affairs and was involved in the historic opening to China. After leaving the NSC staff in 1971, Professor Smizer served as a political minister at the US Embassy in Bonn and then retired from the Foreign Service to become Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees at the United Nations. He's now a professor at Georgetown University. Next is Winston Lord. He joined Kissinger's NSC staff at the very beginning of the Nixon presidency and was one of Kissinger's closest advisors throughout the administration. He worked on every aspect of American foreign policy, including the opening to China, arms control negotiations, negotiations with the Soviet Union, Paris peace talks, Vietnam War. Winston went on to become president of the very prestigious Council on Foreign Relations, an assistant secretary of state and United States ambassador to China, the country with which he helped establish diplomatic relations. And finally, John Negroponte. Ambassador Negroponte was a provincial um, report, uh, officer uh, in South Vietnam and Saigon in the late 1960s before joining the first delegation led by Averill Harriman and Cyrus Vance at the first Paris Peace Talks in 1968. He went on to work on the NSC 
accompanied Nixon and Kissinger on the historic trip to the Soviet Union in June of 1972. He later served as ambassador to Honduras, Mexico, Philippines, the United Nations, and Iraq. That's a lot. He was also an assistant secretary of state, deputy national security advisor, deputy secretary of state, and, as he's most famously known recently, the first director of national intelligence, an office created after the September 11th attacks. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, the effectiveness of the National Security Council staff. Kissinger did assemble one of the most successful and talented and effective NSC staffs in history. And it, the staff was very small by today's standards. Um, in the Kissinger era, there were, I think, less than, 30, less than 50, probably 35 professional staff members, an equal number of support staff, of which I was one. To compare that today to probably 1,700 staff members of all types. But the Kissinger staff and had a lasting effect. They went on to dominate uh, a generation of American diplomacy. As I've just mentioned, these men and others went on to very senior positions in subsequent administrations. But I want to get back to the beginning and get the personal story from each of you. How did Henry Kissinger, who was looking for the most brilliant and talented people, how did he find you? Professor Smyser, how did Henry Kissinger come to notice the brilliant young Foreign Service officer? Well, I'm not sure I was brilliant, but I got to know him when I was doing some graduate studies at Harvard because I took his seminar. And later, when he came to Washington, to work on the national security staff, in fact, to run it. Uh, he knew that I was there, and so he asked me to join him. All right, and had you been in Vietnam before? Had you met Kissinger in Vietnam as I'd well? I met Kissinger in Vietnam when Vietnam, when Kissinger w went to Vietnam to, under, at the request of LBJ to see what the situation was. I was his control officer, which is rather a loose term because controlling Henry Kissinger is not an easy <laughs> thing to do. It's an oxymoron. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. And, uh, but nonetheless, I did it and uh, tried to give him the best possible introduction to Vietnam, including some meetings with John Negro Ponte and others, and of course a briefing by myself, which may or may not have contributed to his knowledge. But the point was that that was where I first met him on Vietnam. Before then, I had talked to him about general account. things. And then, so the two of you were in Vietnam before Kissinger became national security advisor, before Nixon was elected president. And that's when you met Henry that, as well? That's correct. Uh, Dick and I were both in the political section in the embassy in Saigon. And as you mentioned, I was a provincial reporting officer, and I covered a particular area of South Vietnam. And when Henry came out, I was assigned the task of taking him to the northern part of South Vietnam, which was called in military parlance I Corps, the first Corps area. And so that's how I got to uh, know Henry. And then I went to uh, the Paris peace talks under Harriman and Vance, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. And then I was recruited in 1970 to yeah, join there, there's his a, staff. There's, uh, the, the, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a story that when Henry Kissinger was in Saigon with you guys, he had a few incidents. Yes, he, indeed. Well, after we, his first visit to Saigon, which I believe was in 1965, and he was there as an advisor to Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, on one of his last days there, it was November 1st, it was the anniversary of the overthrow of Ngo Dinh Diem, so there was a big parade. Uh, in Saigon, and my apartment overlooked the parade route, and so I gave a little sort of champagne breakfast uh, for a lot of people. And when Henry came, I think Dick brought him through the crowd up to my apartment. When he got there, he realized he'd lost his wallet, and uh, he said what really bothered him was that he'd lost his White House pass. I always remember <laughs> that. <laughs> Can I tell one little story sure, about that, please. Go ahead. <laughs> that visit? Uh, because we wanted to introduce him to the full life of Saigon, we took him to a cabaret, which was... Is this a story we can actually say? Is this PG? Or is this a PG story? Of course it is. Okay. Uh, I mean, heavens, who, who would think that I would tell anything that wouldn't be proper? But the idea was we wanted to have him meet some Vietnam characters who were not necessarily political officers. And so we took him to there, and he got up to the bar, and a young lady of uncertain uh, background came up to meet him and uh, rather clutched him tightly. And he turned to me and said, I think I've been discovered. <laughs> 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 so, so that was a, a pretty thorough kind of briefing on how Vietnam worked. <laughs> 
I don't know how you're going to top that, Winston. Yeah. How did Henry Kissinger find no, you? No, I can't top that. I, I was working in the Pentagon in 1968 in the policy planning staff, and my boss was a man named Mort Halpern. And the first person Kissinger asked to join him on his staff when he took over in 1969 was Halpern to help rearrange the NSC system, which we talked about in another forum. Mort asked me to go with him. I was interviewed by Henry uh, for about half an hour. And I guess it went pretty well, although I think he hired me mostly on the recommendation of Mort. I started out with Mort doing two things uh, in the executive office building across from the White House. One was helping to run the NSC system, all the meetings. We'd put together the agendas, uh, the briefing books, and the implementation of decisions after the meetings. The other was sort of a mini policy planning staff where we sent him memos, looking to the future, playing devil's advocate. And in fact, during that year that I was doing that, the first year on the NSC staff at 69, I sent Henry several memos, some of which were critical of policy. And this makes the point that Henry does not like yes men or yes women. As long as your arguments are well argued, well put forward, uh, he respects them. And I think I caught his attention through these memos, frankly, as well as what we did on the system. So in February 1970, he made me his special assistant. And I was very fortunate because I didn't have expertise like these guys did on Vietnam, others on China, others on Russia, others on the Middle East. But he wanted one person with him at all times in all these developments so that we could have a global perspective. For example, the impact of relations with China and Russia on Hanoi. Mm -hmm. So I got to participate in all these initiatives. I would be paired with the real experts in each case. Which I might add that Wynne also wrote a lot of the speeches. Yeah. And Henry said, Wynne has the fastest pen in the West. Well, he didn't say best, just the fastest. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, I, I think, let's set the stage for history. Because when Nixon took office, we were in the middle of a war. It wasn't a war he started, it was a war he inherited. So Dick, Professor Smizer, why don't you talk to us about what was the historical context? You know, well, what had happened in the 60s? Why were we in Vietnam in the first place? Well, we were in Vietnam in the first place because the French wanted us to be in there. And we didn't want to go be involved quite as much as they wanted us to be involved. They asked us to drop an atomic bomb on uh, Dien Bien Phu when Dien Bien Phu was surrounded by Vietnamese troops. Eisenhower refused to do that. He said, we're not going to get involved in that war. So we were very, very cautious, particularly under Eisenhower, about anything that had to do with Indochina. Then John Kennedy became president. And Kennedy felt that even though he didn't want to drop a bomb, atomic bombs either, he was more ready to practice what they called warfare. Uh, I can't remember. Counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency, that's right, counterinsurgency. So one of his ideas was that Vietnam was the perfect place to practice counterinsurgency, to practice the, what he thought was going to be the new American doctrine, which would win these wars, and counterinsurgency was a thing. And then where were we then when President Johnson was in office? What happened by the late 1960s? By the late 1960s, it became obvious that counterinsurgency could not win the war because the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, mm -hmm. kept sending troops in. And counterinsurgency couldn't defeat them because that counted on the South Vietnamese to do that. So we had to begin sending in American troops. Now, you were, you were in Saigon at the time. I was there from 64 to 68, and I watched this process that Dick is talking about. I mean, what you really had was, I think Hanoi decided sometime in 1964, maybe late 63, after the overthrow of Ngo Dinh Diem, that they couldn't win the war just by political uh, means alone, and, that had, and they had to ratchet up the level of violence, because let's, let's have no doubt about it, they, their purpose in the end was to reunify the country. And so they introduced North Vietnamese troops. By the time we left, or that, that uh, we, the administration transitioned from Johnson to Nixon, we had 510,000 troops. I mean, there was progressive escalation. Even more than that, actually, about 550, I think. OK. Yeah. And, and there were something like 10 regular North Vietnamese divisions in South Vietnam. So this, 
incipient insurgency in 1959-60 evolves into and this that's, and that's large scale of, escalated And that's war. mission creep, right? It started as a small scale counterinsurgency and by Well, the it's time just escalation. I would call it more than mission creep. I'd call it mission escalation. Yeah. Because it was a lot of people. I mean, half a million. Years. And it, it's also a demonstration that the North Vietnamese, poor as they were, mm -hmm. were prepared to go to just about any length to achieve their objectives. Um, what was happening in the United States at the time? In 1968, Nixon wins. 1969, he comes into office. What was Nixon's thinking when he took the oath of office in January of 1969 about Vietnam? Well, there was some foreshadowing in an article he wrote for Foreign Affairs magazine in 67, which has been touted as suggesting the opening to China, but also looked at Asia generally, and particularly Asia after Vietnam, no matter how it came out, what would it look like, whether we had lost or won or was in between. Uh, and during the campaign, he gave suggestions that he, he, he had a strategy uh, in mind. Uh, no actual secret plan, which people seem to think happened. He didn't say that. Uh, so when he got into office, it was clearly the most urgent issue he had to face. It was uh, clear that there, he was stuck between this tremendous domestic turmoil and this escalating threat and American involvement in Southeast Asia. He was caught in between the desire and many in the U.S. to get out and the intransigence and the military power of North Vietnam. So he and Kissinger had a, a obviously real dilemma. And people, future historians and young people, have got to remember the context he inherited in judging how well he and Kissinger did in the su subsequent years. It was a very tough challenge. First thing they did was to, we issued a, what they call a national security study memorandum to all the agencies, mm -hmm. gathering every conceivable type of information that we could from the State Department on political talks, from the CIA on what was going on, from the Pentagon on the military developments, every conceivable aspect that we could collect information on. I was in charge of helping to collect this. Everyone else did most, most of the work, but I was orchestrating it. One of the people I worked with, ironically, was a man named Dan Ellsberg, who went on. He was a hawk at that time, by the way. He went on to be a, a real dub a year or two later and was responsible for leaking the Pentagon Papers. So we assembled that in order to have Nixon and Kissinger make up their minds on what kind of strategy they wanted to pursue. They probably had some ideas before the study, but the, all the information helped to shape it. And if you like, I can quickly yeah, what were tell the you options? the options. One option, of course, they had was to say, look, the Democrats did this, Kennedy and Johnson. Mm -hmm. It's not our fault. We're just going to get our prisoners back and get the hell out of there. Now, Nixon rejected that because of our position in the world. The sacrifice had been made, the credibility of the United States as an ally what it would do to our world position. The other extreme was uh, incredible escalation to try to force North Vietnam to be more reasonable. Uh, I think Nixon and Kissinger felt the domestic support for the war would not be maintained under those circumstances. So they chose uh, a middle pass, which they felt was a way to get an honorable ending to this war, and essentially consisted of two main elements and two supporting elements. One main element was Vietnamization, which was to successfully turn over to the South Vietnamese the burden of fighting the war. This would take several years, but through training and supplies, we would have them take more and more of the burden of combat, and the US would be able to uh, withdraw in successive segments. This would mean that the South Vietnamese had to realize they had to take the burden and give them a sense of urgency and responsibility. But above all, it would maintain support in the United States for continuing involvement, because people could see the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, that we were reducing our casualties, reducing our presence, and that therefore they would support ongoing uh, efforts. Uh, the second main element was negotiations, and we'll get into that, but which they decided had to be done secretly in order to be possible uh, success. Uh, there's no other way through these public exchanges that you involved in and others. There were propaganda exercises in Paris, so they had to be done secretly. The supporting elements were to deal with China and Russia, Hanoi's two major patrons, uh, and to improve relations with them, including the dramatic opening to China, which in turn got Russians to deal with this more pragmatically. 
to isolate psychologically at least Hanoi, maybe not cut off A, we didn't expect that, but at least to urge Hanoi to be somewhat reasonable so they could get on with their relationships with us. And then finally, to use military pressure when and if it was required, particularly in response to North Vietnamese provocations. Now, the last point I'll make is that uh, the one flaw in this, and it, they understood that, Nixon and Kissinger at the time, was there was a certain tension between Vietnamization, which is gradual US withdrawal, but nevertheless unilateral withdrawal, turning it over to South Vietnamese, and negotiations, because you could argue that the North Vietnamese knew we were getting out unilaterally anyway. They might judge that the South Vietnamese would never be strong enough to take them on by themselves, so they would sit back and wait and not negotiate seriously. So that leverage you might have had was not there when well, they I, knew. Well, the, the judgment on that, and we thought all this through, was first place, there wasn't any better alternatives, at least Nixon and Kissinger felt, for an honorable end to the war, mm -hmm. but without an endless uh, involvement. And secondly, we, we planned and hoped to do the Vietnamization in a responsible way that would give the South Vietnamese the time and the equipment and the training to actually take on uh, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, and that Hanoi would be forced to negotiate more reasonably. We're willing to be rather forthcoming on that uh, because they could see that over time they couldn't prevail. You know, it was talking about Vietnamization. You were there. Yeah, can I? Uh, I was yeah. going to mention uh, two points. One, one with regard to Vietnamization, and I noticed that Dr. Kissinger's book on the Vietnam negotiations is dedicated, among others, to General Creighton Abrams. And, and this is a very important point because in 1964, when LBJ had to choose who the next commander in Vietnam would be, the next American commander of MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, he had to choose between Westmoreland and Creighton Abrams. And regrettably, he chose Westmoreland. And Westmoreland put tremendous emphasis on the Americans doing the fighting of the North Vietnamese main forces themselves. He, he stuck to that principle right to the end of his command. And it's Abrams who came in and, and his view of how to fight this war dovetailed very nicely with the Nixon-Kissinger approach of, of, of training the, the South Vietnamese troops and giving them the capacity to fight the war. And the, the reason I think Vietnamization was so important, it's a principle you ha that carries forward into other conflicts in the future, what we did in Afghanistan, what we've done in Iraq, and so forth. And it's the same notion that, that, that comes up there. The second point I wanted to make was that although uh, uh, Winston uh, wasn't there and, and Dick, there were secret negotiations during the LBJ time. And they, they, they never got very far. But they did get so far as to uh, achieve a bombing halt at the end of 1968, in October of 68, right prior to our uh, presidential elections, and they ended up getting a seat at the table for the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese, because prior to that, we've been conducting right. these talks bilaterally with North Vietnam. I think it's important, and maybe Professor Smizer, you can talk about it. We've talked about the North Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, the Viet Cong. Who were all of these different groups? Well, they were all controlled, excuse me, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong were all controlled by the same group, which was the old Indo-Chinese Communist Party, which had been developed actually before World War II, mm -hmm. and had at one point wanted close ties with the United States, but it never worked out. And they were groups that wanted to fight against the West in order to make Vietnam independent, truly independent. And so they were people who normally would have been our friends, but because of the French were also our allies. We couldn't very well work with the Vietnamese to make Vietnam independent because that would be a loss for the French. So we were stuck behind or between working with our allies in Europe or working with countries that actually wanted to be our friends in Asia. And it was a very, very difficult situation. And we finally decided that the best thing to do was just to work with our friends in Europe and to try to help our friends in Europe achieve some kind of peaceful settlement for their wars with the independent people or with the people seeking independence. It never was quite right. It never worked quite the way we wanted to have to work. And that was one of the problems. And I think 
John Negroponte puts it very well. It was one of the real problems that we faced because we were stuck between people who wanted to be our friends and whom we wanted as friends, but who were fighting each other. One of the most difficult situations in international politics, and if this group has a bunch of people and students who study international politics, it's worthwhile to look at this as a situation of incredible difficulty for the management of foreign affairs. I might add, just to underline his point, the North Vietnamese always acted out the charade. They had no troops in South Vietnam. This was all Viet Cong uprising and a civil war. Their rationale, of course, was that we had undermined the prospect of elections, which had been agreed upon in Geneva a few years earlier. And so therefore, they had a right to challenge, challenge us on that front. But the fact is that this was not a civil war primarily. It was a North Vietnamese invasion, and the Viet Cong were an arm of the North Vietnamese. Um, when you talked about uh, another part of the decision that Nixon made was to have negotiations. Now, you were already negotiating publicly in Geneva, but that in was Paris. Or Paris. Paris. That was going no place. Well, well, we'd been negotiating both publicly and privately, and as I mentioned, we had some secret talks between Mr. Vance and Harriman and later Tall also in Swin Tui. And we reached an agreement uh, at the, uh, just on the eve of the presidential elections in 1968. And this is a pattern that repeats itself four years later. The, we, the, the greatest pressure to reach some kind of agreement was right uh, one month before uh, our elections on a bombing halt in exchange. We would stop bombing North Vietnam in exchange for them uh, lowering the intensity of their attacks on South Vietnamese cities. And then we also agreed that the South, Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese parties would be represented mm -hmm. at the peace talks, which is what led to what, for many people, was this rather absurd discussion for about a month at the end of 1968 on the shape of the table. How do you shape the negotiating table in order to reflect the two opposite views of the situation? We felt that, that the Viet Cong should not be viewed as a separate party. And, and the South Vietnamese government wanted to be viewed separately from us. And so how do you achieve that? How in, did you achieve In the that? shape of a negotiation. Well, we had a sort of an oval table with two small tables on each side, but they didn't quite touch <laughs> the oval table. I, it was Diplomacy unbelievable. Diplomacy is a wonderful art. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you can't imagine, it was like a contest. We got so much mail from people all around the world suggesting different shapes of tables <laughs> to help us solve our problem. <laughs> An interesting thing about this also, and John was more involved in it than I was, was that Harriman kept wanting, and this was Ambassador Avery Harriman who was our negotiator while... Uh, in the in Johnson, Johnson administration. Yeah. Yes, in the Johnson administration. And Harriman knew very well that nothing could ever be done in public. So he tried very hard to get the North Vietnamese to join us for secret talks. And the idea was that we would have breaks in the talks. And during those breaks, he would hook his arm into the arm of whoever the Vietnamese, the North Later Vietnamese Tho. guy was, Leduc Tho or Huan Tui or whoever, and take him aside and say, don't you want to have a little coffee break? Don't you want to have a little tea? And so on and so forth. And at first, the North Vietnamese resisted. They wouldn't play that game because they didn't want to do something which the, North, the Russians or the Chinese might wonder was going on. Mm -hmm. And then finally they did, and that's when we got through the So break. Harriman calls me into his office one day. I'd been responsible for finding the safe, safe house that we were going to meet at, right. along with a CIA agent in the embassy in Paris. He gives me a few hundred francs out of his pocket. He says, go buy some caviar, because we're going to serve caviar to them during <laughs> the tea break. And I, I knew. I told him, you know, Governor, they don't. The Vietnamese don't like caviar. They like sweet things. They like cakes. You know, I mean, I've, I'd watched them long enough in my life. And so when we got to the tea break that day and there was all this caviar out there, uh, no one in the Vietnamese delegation ate the caviar. They all went for the sweets. The Americans had the caviar. So, so then what, how did the Nixon administration well, then deal with this well, secret? Well, of course, talk? Nixon and Kissinger knew all this history and above all the frustrations of dealing with North Vietnam. There was an attempt in the early months to try to see whether we could start secret talks with the Vietnamese, again, recognizing only secret talks would make success. In May, uh, 
the president made his first pronouncement uh, in a speech which basically reviewed the bidding on how tough the North Vietnamese were, the efforts he had already made to try to make progress, mm -hmm. sort of setting the stage for uh, what was going to be a difficult process and making clear that the North Vietnamese were tough, tough to deal with. The next significant event was in June of 1969. Nixon was in Guam as part of an Asian trip. And it wasn't a prepared statement, but he thought about it in advance. He laid out what later became known as the Guam Doctrine and then the Nixon Doctrine. Gets back to a point that is made earlier about how this applies to other issues, uh, the principles of this uh, besides Vietnam. Namely, he said out there, we're going to be a world leader still. He was talking primarily about Asia, but it had global implications. But increasingly, we look to our friends and allies to take more of the burdens of the front lines. We'll always provide a nuclear umbrella. We will train and, and, and support and provide aid to other countries. Uh, but they increasingly have to take on these responsibilities. Uh, now, this clearly was the, th the theory of Vietnamization. Mm -hmm. it, it turns out we then developed that into a more general Nixon doctrine over the next couple of years for world policy in general. So that was the, uh, uh, the next step. Then in August, uh, Let's see, I want to check my, yeah, in August, it was the first secret meeting with the North Vietnamese. Uh, none of us were involved in that, I don't believe, is before we took over. And that was rather, uh, rather fruitless. So that leads to the next uh, major item, namely a major speech in November 1969. And this is the famous silent majority speech. And the purpose of this speech was to rally American domestic support for continued efforts. Part of that was, as we've already indicated, the Vietnamization process, which had begun, and he was beginning to announce in increments withdrawals as we turned over the responsibilities to the South Vietnamese uh, to show American people it wasn't open-ended. And later on, he turned the draft into a lottery as opposed to uh, the other aspects of it, which were more unfair, and uh, that helped to ease the situation as well. But the main thrust of that speech was red meat, and it was very tough very tough on North Vietnamese uh, and designed to show how intransigent uh, they were. So that's essentially what happened in 1969. But then what about the secret negotiations? I mean, how were you able to have a number of secret negotiations and nobody noticed you'd left the yeah, White House? Uh, let me, uh, and then uh, my colleagues will want to <laughs> fill in. Me, this is quite uh, instructive on how we did this, uh, the logistics. When we did do secret negotiations and they picked up speed February, March, and April were the next ones in 1970 in Paris. <clears throat> Here's how it would go for all of us. We're working all week. I'd say our work week was roughly between 80 and 100 hours a week, literally. So we're already exhausted. We have a secret meeting coming up, <clears throat> which only a few people know about. Nixon, Kissinger, Haldeman, and three or four of us. That's it. We start secretly during our work week to prepare the briefing books for that secret negotiation. This included a memo to the president laying out our strategy and our goals for that meeting. It included an exhausting briefing book for Kissinger of his opening statement, fallback statements, probable North Vietnamese positions, transcripts of previous meetings, profiles of their leaders. So we go home from the NSC on Friday night. This was always done on weekends or holidays because Kissinger's absence was not so glaring if it was over a weekend and, you'd, and Hay could sort of cover for him. If he did it during the work week, you, you couldn't get away with this. So we go home Friday night already exhausted at this point. Saturday morning, a, a White House car picks us up at our home. I don't remember how we got our classified materials on the plane, but somehow they got on the airplane. We go to Andrews Air Force Base and join Henry on Air Force Two, or one of the presidential planes. We then fly over the Atlantic and to the center of France, a military airport in the center of France, because we had the cooperation of the French to do this. It secret. was or Orléans. Oh. Orléans, like in New Orleans. It no, was I think Orléans. it's, well, in France. Once, I see. At yeah. one point, we went to Villa Couple, but anyway, okay. it doesn't matter. So on the way over, of course. And nobody was noticing that Air Force One is landing? No, that's not Air Force One. Or Air Force no, no, that's why we had to go to the center of France. And we did it. The cover was that it was an Air Force training mission. That's how we filed our flight plan. Which it actually <laughs> was. Well, in, in some ways. So on the, on the plane, of course, Henry is never satisfied with any briefing book. 
So all the way over for eight hours, we're redoing the briefing book, right? Right. So we get in the, uh, the, the center of France, the special assistant to Pompidou, the president, a man named Jobert, who finally became foreign minister. Uh, he lent us the plane, a, a small French plane in the middle of uh, Paris, I mean, in France. We take that plane to uh, a, an obscure airport on the outside of Paris, where we're met by General Walters, who was our military attache uh, in Paris, went on to be ambassador to the UN and Germany and so on, but was fluent in French, among other things, and loved the James Bond aspects of this. He rented a car. He couldn't use his own car. We each had code names. I'm going to let Negroponte tell us what the code names were, because we had to encounter at this safe house apartment we went to, the cleaning lady, and we, we didn't want her to know who we were. So we go to this, we go to the apartment. At this time, it's about midnight Paris time, but it's about late afternoon in Washington. So it's, we have trouble getting to sleep because it's late afternoon our time. So at least in my case, I would finally get to sleep about an hour or two before we had to get up which was, say, 6 or 7 a.m. Paris time, which is about midnight Washington time. We then go into a meeting for, say, six to eight hours, verbatim notes. We finish the and, meeting. And we're at our best, of course. Yes. And we finish the meeting. We go back to the airport. We take the plane to back to the center of France. We get on that plane and fly back all the way over. We're writing a memo to the president on what happened at the meeting. We're beginning to type up the transcripts of the meeting. We get back to Washington, uh, at which point it was about 6 AM Paris time, but midnight Washington time. We go to sleep, come to the office on Monday morning, As pretend if we happened. had the whole weekend off. <laughs> so that's really what happened. And so Henry was General Kirschbaum. I remember that. <laughs> and Winston was Colonel Landry, and I being the junior person in the and group I was, was Lieutenant uh, yes. I don't know. Well, I don't I know. Why you I, no, I was Schmidlatz because Schmidlatz. he wanted to use my initials. And uh, so yeah, I, each of us had the same initials. You must have been S. Well, I just remember uh, or being Ann. Newman, yeah, Lieutenant Ann, Newman. Yeah, that's yeah. An Ann. Okay, you, you I, I, I asked Henry if he would give proper credit to Mr. Schmidlatz if there was a real peace agreement, and he regarded that as a non-essential question. <laughs> You, when you were preparing the briefing materials, and for, uh, two problems. One, we didn't have direct ability to pick up the phone to the North Vietnamese, right? right. So how do we communicate with them? And then secondly, you, you're this young staff of young guys, and you're assembling mountains of briefing papers. And how did you do that without letting the State Department, the Defense Department, anybody else know that you were doing this? Yeah, like so many other things, like the China opening and dealing with the Russians, unfortunately, the State Department was not involved. But we had plenty of papers, first from the original Nissan that I mentioned, uh, the study memorandum, but also <coughs> continuing. With, I mean, there was public aspects to the war and, and so on, and Paris peace talks were going on publicly. So we had lots of background material. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had experts, not me, but these two guys knew a lot about uh, Vietnam. So there was enough firepower to, to prepare these memos. And it, it does underline the relationship between Nixon and Kissinger again, which was a fantastic uh, compliment. Uh, Nixon had to decide on the key decisions and the overall strategy for each meeting, uh, but Henry would give him ways of how we could try to accomplish that and then actually go, go negotiate it. I mean, how did you negotiate? How did you contact the North Vietnamese? Through you General going Waters in Paris. Ah, uh, okay. So you were not going through the State Department, which no, would have been. No. And we weren't going through the embassy. The embassy is a formal diplomatic channel. And we didn't want to use a formal diplomatic channel. Right. Instead, we used General Walters, who was an army attaché. And so that's not formal State Department channel. Mm -hmm. So 1969, you had really nothing. Um, there was a silent majority speech. The talks really were going nowhere. The fighting was escalating. And then 1970, what happened in 1970? Was more escalation? Well, we had three meetings in the spring of 1970 that didn't really get anywhere. So this led us to this, uh, that spring. First, let me say that we had ongoing secretly, starting in 69, a bombing in Cambodia along the border with Vietnam. And that was part this, of the original Nixon decision, this was going to be the policy? Well, it was part of the decision. See, the problem with Vietnam, of course, was that they, 
had these sanctuaries in Cambodia and Laos, which were essentially untouchable. And so they would come across the border and go back over, in, in the case of Cambodia, or come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail in the case of Laos. And it was a very tough fight that, in any event, but to have these sanctuaries made it even tougher. So we bombed Cambodia secretly, only close to the border, but it was secret, and this, when it did leak out, uh, there was outrage, particularly by the Congress and the media. The rationale for doing it and doing it secretly was, number one, we wanted to hit the, the bases along the border because they were coming across slaughtering Americans and going back over to Cambodia. Uh, secondly, it had to be secret because Sihanouk, who was then heading Cambodia, Prince Sihanouk. didn't like the North Vietnamese in his country, but couldn't do a hell of a lot about it. But he tolerated these raids, but he couldn't tolerate it if it became public because then he would admit that he was letting Americans bomb his territory. But he fully approved of it, and it was done along the border with the minimal civilian casualties. Nevertheless, it became very controversial. Mm -hmm. That then leads us to, uh, since we're getting nowhere in the secret talks, to what we call the Cambodian incursion. Uh, and that was in I'll, the spring, wanna, April 1970. I can take this on. Uh, you can. Yeah, well, I'm at Stanford University at that time, so in a way, it's an interesting uh, perspective from having uh, sure. for having seen that because I was on a sabbatical sort of year, and the incursions, I believe, took place in April or so. Yeah, of, April 30, uh, 1970, yeah. and I was at the Hoover Institution. And those of you who know Hoover, they have one, they have a big tower, but then next door they have this big glass building. Well, there wasn't much left of the glass in that building after. The Cambodian so encouragement, and so it, point, uh, campuses erupted. And I think well, you had Kent State, of course, yeah, where people. Right. But let me explain the rationale here. The NSC uh, and the cabinet had to debate whether to go into Cambodia and go after these uh, enclaves and sanctuaries. The first decision was do you do it at all? Secondly, if you do it, do you do it with just South Vietnamese troops or do you have American troops with them? And thirdly, how do you do it? How long do you go in there? How deep do you go into Cambodia? How do you know you've succeeded? The decision that was finally made was, first, we, we had to do it because Americans were getting slaughtered. We were not extending the war into Cambodia. The North Vietnamese had violated Cambodian sovereignty for years, and they had these safe sanctuaries. So we had an obligation to our troops and the South Vietnamese troops to try to do something about it. So it was decided to go in there. It was also decided to make a joint you certainly want the South Vietnamese in the lead, but to really be effective militarily, the feeling was the Americans had to be with them. Thirdly, however, to show that it wasn't an invasion, it wasn't open-ended, it was decided to limit the duration, namely about two months, and the depth, namely only a few miles going in. So that was the basic decision. Now, uh, the problem was that since it was limited because of domestic reaction and world reaction to the incursion, in duration and scope, uh, it was less effective militarily. The other mistake we made was we sort of pronounced it as going after their headquarters, and there was no such thing existed as if there was some building we could capture. Their headquarters is really their leadership moving around, and of course they moved deeper into Cambodia to escape. So we never got their headquarters, and so it was sort of considered uh, less than successful. Now the fact is it did lower American casualties, it helped speed up Vietnamization, had some military impact. But counterbalanced against that was the tremendous domestic uh, reaction that we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's uh, one other episode I might add, because this is a famous uh, Kissinger meeting with his Dove members of his staff. Just before the announcement of the decision to go in, Kissinger, as I said, did not like yes people. He always wanted to hear all points of view, called into his office five staff members who he knew would oppose this incursion. Uh, I won't get into all the names, but I was one of them because I was, I was in support of the pos positions we were taking on Vietnam. But uh, I was somewhat dovish in terms of eagerness yeah, to expanding. try to negotiate a settlement. As a result of this meeting, we had a two hours with Henry, a very stormy meeting while we didn't think it was a good idea. After the meeting, three of those in the meeting and a couple others outside the meeting resigned from the staff over Cambodia. Two who resigned, very frankly, were going to resign anyway. In the summer, they were staying on, but they moved it up in order to make a statement on Cambodia. But they were about to leave anyway, not out of substance, but out of exhaustion. Uh, I did not resign. The other person who didn't resign was a system analyst and wasn't caught up in some of the emotional debates. My reasoning was not that I was against it. 
uh, like the others were for moral and ethical reasons. I felt it was entirely moral and ethical. It was hot pursuit. These people were killing American troops and South Vietnamese. We had a right to go after them. Uh, and we had a legal right to do so. Uh, so I, I didn't argue it emotionally like some of the others uh, who felt we were extending the war and so on. I didn't think we were extending the war. The North Vietnamese extended the war. My feeling was the trade-off between the military impact, particularly with the duration and scope limited, versus the uproar domestically and the loss of support for the war wasn't worth it. Uh, and so I argued on those grounds, but I didn't resign because I didn't think it was a moral or ethical problem. I thought it was a practical problem. Ironically, I was then asked a couple months later to write the report on the success of this. Uh, and it's 30,000. I was out in San Clemente. I handed Kissinger the penultimate draft. We had 48 hours to go, and my colleagues will understand this. He comes in. We literally have 40 hours before it's going to be published. He takes the draft, almost literally throws it on the floor, and says, this is absolutely useless which didn't help my morale a great deal. Uh, so I had one night to redo the whole damn thing, uh, which I did. And I went to bed, and he woke me up. He said, this is terrific. Now, it couldn't have gotten that much better that soon, but in any event, we made it. <laughs> so one upshot of this, and, and it, it's the direct segue, is there are five resignations. And so Henry then starts casting about looking for replacements for those people. And that's how I got recruited initially to be on a sort of a planning staff for uh, the NSC in September of uh, uh, 1970. And then later on took over mm -hmm. from Dick, who was running the, the Indochina operation at the NSC uh, the following summer. Well, you, I think, can I say something oh, please, in general please. here? It's very difficult. I, as I look around the faces in this room, I see many faces that were not in Washington alive and kicking and sentient in the 1970s. The mood in this country is so difficult to describe to anybody in that group because it was a poisonous mood. We were not fighting only the Vietnamese. We were fighting the Americans. The, we, the New York Times would write incredibly lengthy editorials criticizing whatever negotiating position we took. The other newspapers would do the same. Not all. I mean, some, some were quite positive. But nonetheless, the campuses were literally hotbeds of resistance. I went to Harvard. Uh, after having been in the Kissinger staff for a while. And my faculty friends at Harvard told me that they would never mention to anybody whom they dealt with at Harvard that I had been on the NSC because I would be kicked off the campus. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of mood that was absolutely poisonous and that made it very, very difficult because no matter what we did, there was always somebody who would criticize. And what do you do when you're fighting a war and every move you make is criticized not only by your opponents, but also by the people whom you regard as your friends? This, is a, this was a very difficult decision. I think it, it, it's so important to make this point. I was a student at George Washington University. And in 1971, the whole semester of classes were canceled. So my university could house the students who were coming all over the country to participate in the demonstrations. We all got in, we all got pass fail in our courses, but we never went to class for that entire semester. Well, there are two other dimensions here. First, Nixon and Kissinger were particularly bitter because some of the most vociferous critics were people of the Johnson and Kennedy administrations who got us into this war in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. then they turned. And he felt the establishment in general, not just the Harvard faculty, turned on uh, people, at least in Kissinger and Nixon's view, were trying to end this honorably. You can disagree on that. And who, the by the way, in the Johnson administration, had not withdrawn one single troop from Vietnam, despite right. the fact that the talks had started right. in May. That's right. That's they, right. Would, they, never had, they never were prepared to step up to some of the difficult issues right. involved in disengagement. So this really made frankly, all of us rather bitter. These people who got us in there and who got us up to 550,000 troops were now suddenly turning on their successors, particularly since Nixon could have said, as I said earlier, we right. inherited this mess. We're getting out. It's their fault. The other 
uh, dimension that was painful. Yeah, we'll get sure. back to this. Uh, in the secret talks, nobody knew we were negotiating seriously. So we would make offers to the North Vietnamese that were more generous than what the New York Times was calling for, but nobody knew that. And so all my friends, liberal and moderate and everyone else, said, why the hell aren't you negotiating seriously? All they could see were the public propaganda exchanges. And I knew secretly that we were making every effort in the North Vietnamese of being unreasonable. And so it was really painful for all of us. Not that we had much social life. We were never out of the office. <laughs> but to the extent we saw anybody, they were beating us up for working on this war without trying to negotiate an end. Meanwhile, I'd just come back from Paris where we were trying to do the exact same thing. Yeah. But you couldn't mention it. Couldn't mention it. Now, whose decision was it to make these talks secret? Was it so that you could advance more it it was was better negotiations? I mean, well, it was who mutual. had the courage uh, we, to do it? We, we felt you cannot make progress with, with propaganda or whatever, the whole world watching. You've got to do it secretly. That, that was our feeling. I think the North Vietnamese probably weren't that interested in negotiations except as a tactic to wear us out mm -hmm. or to see whether we'd make a kind of deal that they, they could live with. But they didn't want to be accused of the Viet Cong and others of being overly soft, so they just as soon have it secret to it. What do you think, John? Well, I mean, I think here, <clears throat> Winston and I may differ slightly because I think that it's, I think it's important to have secret negotiations. They, they, they accompany almost any negotiation about a serious issue. But I think Henry had a somewhat expansive view of that, which included keeping it secret from our entire bureaucracy. Oh, that's a different issue. And yeah. I, think I meant he, the public. No, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I understand. But my, my yeah. point is that for yeah. him, secret negotiations also <laughs> meant secret not everybody. telling the State Department or the Pentagon or you know right. keeping them somewhat Let, in the Let's dark. explore that for a little while. I mean, on one hand, you were negotiating. And, and as you point out, you were exhausted. You were negotiating in good faith. Everything you seemed to try wasn't working. You were getting beaten up in the press. People were demonstrating. You, you know, called you baby killers. It was a terrible time. And yet, at the same time, you were keeping, um, the, I guess, President Nixon had the courage to take that because he right. thought it was the most effective way to negotiate an end to the war. But talk to me about why was it kept secret from the rest of the government? Was that essential, do you think? Because everything leaks in Washington. Yeah, that's the quick answer. That's and Nixon and Kissinger are particularly sensitive. Well, and, and Henry, you know, for both good and ill, was very possessive of our national security and diplomatic. Well, he only could be because uh, Nixon was possessed. Right, yeah. and, but yeah. I mean, there's not been anybody right. since Henry Kissinger who's been as, had has right. m as much authority or power over our national security policy. Right. No, no one individual. Right. Either in the State Department or in the well, anywhere. any job. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was incredibly difficult. Again, you have to see the mood of the country at the time. Mm -hmm. It was simply incredibly difficult to keep a secret. Mm -hmm. Because of the passions of because the issue. Because of the very... Yeah. And the word right. It would have leaked immediately. The no. word passions is a very moderate word for what was going on. I might add one other thing. Now, we'll get to this a little bit later in the chronology, mm -hmm. but when these talks, these secret talks became known, uh, then we had sort of semi-secret talks, mm -hmm. namely for, for in 1972, which we'll get to. We, we would not announce in advance we were having talks. We would secretly go over and have the talks, but then afterwards we would brief we in the North Vietnamese would each brief the press on what happened. So they were still secret in a sense. Nobody knew what was going on except for right. the rather sanitized briefings afterwards. All right, let's flash forward. So 69, 70, 71, escalation negotiations, nothing seems to happen. When did the breakthrough come? We're now at the end of 19, uh, middle 1971. Kissinger made a secret trip to China. Did that change everything? Well, I think we have to ba back up for a second here. First, uh, I just check in the chronology because it's we quite extensive. Laos. We had the Laos incursion. We can talk on that. I'll let the others it's handle that. It's a waste that. of time. Uh, but it was trying again. It's the, the, the basic point that they had these sanctuaries, in this case, coming down to Ho Chi Minh Trail. The quick answer is it was the South Vietnamese expedition, essentially, with our support because of constrictions of Congress. And it wasn't very effective. I think it's right. Uh, so then uh, what happened, though, very significant, that's why we have to stop for a minute, is May 1971. We had a secret meeting in which we set forth, obviously with Nixon's full approval, what essentially became the agreement a year and a half later. It essentially was the following. It was a military-only agreement. The North Vietnamese position from the very beginning until the breakthrough that we'll get to was not only are we supposed to withdraw unilaterally, but as we 
leave Vietnam, we are supposed to overthrow the Thieu government and install a coalition government. And not force them to leave. And not force, no, as I said, unilaterally, yeah. So that was their position. And Nixon was prepared to have a military-only solution, uh, but he was not prepared to overthrow an ally for all the reasons of world credibility, morality, and sacrifice. The May proposal, and this is very important for history because a lot of revisionists are saying we could have had the final agreement a lot earlier. We couldn't have had it because until the breakthrough that we'll get to, which is October mm -hmm. 72, the North Vietnamese insisted on replacing the two government. So in May 71, we put a seven-point plan forward, consisted of the following. Unilateral withdrawal, but no further infiltration. We weren't insisting on mutual withdrawal, which had been our principle up until then, but no further infiltration across the DMZ of any more <coughs> North Vietnamese troops. Uh, ceasefire, get our prisoners back, independence and ceasefire in Laos and Cambodia, and international supervision. That is essentially what the final Paris Accords look like, with some obviously detailed changes. We put that forward, and for the first time, the North Vietnamese began to take us, I mean, they see there was something to negotiate, but they continued to hang on to the political settlement dimension. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't strike a deal, because that to us was dishonorable and, and so on. But they wouldn't budge on that. And so these promising negotiations of the seven points, we sort of agreed in about five or five and a half with a lot of details to come. But we couldn't get to the seventh point, which essentially was the political future of South Vietnam is to be determined by the Vietnamese themselves. Uh, and it doesn't mean overthrowing uh, the government. Uh, and so we then ran into an impasse, even though we had some hopes. It included the opening to China. Henry's se uh, secret trip was uh, in uh, July 71, uh, coming back, and Dick Smyers was on that trip with me, and as we came back from the secret trip to China, it was a public trip generally, including a stop in Paris, and uh, I'll let Dick give some of the color of uh, how we managed to pull that secret uh, negotiation off in Paris on our way back this is before the president announced in San Clemente that so China opened. So secret trip to China, and, and then it's on the way back from China. Paris. We stopped off in Paris publicly, and then Dick, you might explain how we managed to have a secret negotiation in Paris. Well, we had Henry having dinner with an attractive young lady who was a correspondent in uh, Paris, and uh, that provided a cover for our business because since he was having this dinner with this woman, nobody suspected that he might also be having a negotiation with the Vietnamese. And he was and roundly he, criticized for, oh, uh, yeah. with a date instead of t talking, because everyone knew Lady Octo was in town. That's right. Everybody knew that Lady Octo was in town. And why is Henry seeing this woman, who was a reporter, I think, for the New York Times or for one of these newspapers, why is Henry seeing this woman instead of meeting with Le Duc Thu, which in fact he had been doing only an hour earlier. But this was the kind of mood that, that existed at the time, and it, it was crazy. But there was one very important meet, point, which I think I focused on more than anybody else, though it later became moot, and that was that when Henry said that we would do a unilateral withdrawal, that was the first time that we went into the negotiating session with the North Vietnamese at their private villa that they had tables for us to negotiate. Up until that time, we had sat in chairs like this, and the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, did not think that was a real negotiation. But once Henry said, we are prepared to withdraw unilaterally, they said, aha, they have come to one of our most basic points, and therefore, we will now have a table. <laughs> it, it's these little things, again, you know, diplomacy is a funny game. And you look for little things that tell you a great deal about what is behind the thinking of people who are not ready to articulate it. It's, it, it's kind of tricky, but on the other hand, it's absolutely essential. So By you the way, think, I might quickly mention yeah. that during this period, the Pentagon Papers were released, uh, leaked out. And uh, they were just a review of, of Vietnam a situation, military and diplomatic, during the Johnson and Kennedy years. It had nothing to do with Nixon. So it wasn't any embarrassment to Nixon. 
but he got hammered for opposing the leak of these papers mm -hmm. uh, as if he was trying to uh, cover things up. It was just making his predecessors look bad. But he felt it was an important principle, one, you don't leak classified documents. But he and, and Kissinger were particularly upset because June 71 was precisely a month before we were going to China secretly. And we're in the middle of these promising negotiations with the Vietnamese. Uh, and so they were doing this on behalf of their successes, where you try to keep some relevant secrets, but also the timing was atrocious. Are you going to talk about China? Yeah, we're now well, getting to that. Um, okay. In the fall of 1971, though, you think things are going well, but the North Vietnamese, you detect, are gearing up for another offensive. Right. And so then let's go to 1972. That was the right. big breakthrough year. Right. That was the momentous year. For a lot of reasons, as, as Professor Smyser pointed out, Nixon went to China in February and Moscow in June. The Watergate break-in occurred yeah, he in He went Manchester. to Moscow the end of May, but. Right. Yeah. The Watergate break-in occurred at roughly the same time. And then in November, there was a landslide re-election of Richard Nixon. Yeah. I do think, I know we have to get through this, but we've got to circle back to the spring of 71. Okay. When the North Vietnamese unleashed a major offensive uh, uh, spring of 72, excuse 72, me. 72. Yeah, yeah, but I, uh, so we'll get But they were that. gearing up to it by the yeah. end of 1971. Yeah. But you, so, you, in Jan so let's go through 1972, because that was the big yeah, year. Right. January of 72, Nixon goes public with the secret talks. He gave a speech on January 25th, because in the preceding months, despite this promise over the summer with the seven point plan, the, the North Vietnamese began to back away, delayed any further talks, started gearing up for a military offensive, mm -hmm. and we would continue to get hammered by our domestic uh, audiences about not negotiating seriously. So he decided we had to finally go public with the fact we've been negotiating for two or three years, and the fact it was North Vietnam that was being a tragedy. And he laid out our seven-point plan with some elaborations to make clear how reasonable we were and to put pressure uh, on Hanoi. And it did rally uh, American uh, public opinion a great deal. For a while. For a while. For a while. Now, so that's January. Yeah, that's January. And then the, the North Vietnamese did not respond. Uh, they were giving, uh, and they they launched this uh, offensive. We had one last chance in a secret trip to Moscow. I believe you were on it, John. Well, let me June. Well, let me pick up before yeah. that because that's that this is yeah. critical, really. It's I believe March 30th of 1972 that they launch the offensive. It was Easter, right. and there are a lot of Catholics in Vietnam. So, I mean, it was called the, uh, the Easter Offensive. Offensive. And it was major, and it was frontally, it was right across the DMZ. And, uh, and they actually came up against a pretty good Arvin division. It was the first Arvin division. And we threw everything we had uh, at this offensive, and actually, over a period of time, succeeded in turning it around. And it was not actually, not a bad test of Vietnamization, but uh, mm -hmm. it required a lot of our air support. But uh, <clears throat> it was a major, major effort and a, a, a precursor, really, of what ultimately happened in Vietnam. The, the, Viet the North Vietnamese were now willing to send conventional forces Invade right South across Vietnam, the border. Invade South Vietnam, officially. But let's go back for like one month, because there was the 1972 February trip where Nixon went to China. You went with him. Um, what well, impact did that have on Vietnam, if any? Well, uh, we do know the Chinese weighed in with the Vietnamese, but not in a way that would be overly pressuring them. It was their self-interest to have our relationship with China not complicated by the Vietnam War with American troops on their border. Also, they wanted us to balance the Soviet Union, and they knew that if we were preoccupied with Vietnam, we wouldn't be such an effective global balance with the Soviet Union. So the Chinese had an interest in having us end this war, but the, we tried to make clear to them, Henry did, I think with success, that we're willing to get out and we're willing to get our prisoners back and ceasefire. We're not willing to overthrow the two government, mm -hmm. and it's not in China's interest to have the U.S. look like an unreliable uh, ally because you want us to help balance the Soviets. So we do think the Chinese, and we know they took some trips to Hanoi, did weigh in to say, make a reasonable settlement. They probably said, look, wait the Americans out, get them out of Vietnam, don't insist on humiliation by a political settlement, and in a few years, uh, Saigon will fall in your laps anyway. Yeah, but... but the, uh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I'm, well, I don't want to no, no, dominate too much here, but we, we had also with the Russians uh, a, a secret trip in April 
to set up the May summit with the That's Russians, right. mm -hmm. another isolation of Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And we try to get them to get the Vietnamese to meet with us. Already the offensive was taking place. We had one May 2nd meeting with North Vietnam, and they were terribly arrogant because they were on the offensive. We got nowhere. So as a result of this, we decided to bomb Hanoi and mine Haiphong. Now, this is an important point yeah. because the chronology is Nixon goes in February. The North Vietnamese invade South Vietnam right. in the spring offensive a month right. later. You're already negotiating with a planned trip to Moscow to have Nixon go visit Moscow for the Moscow summit. The North Vietnamese look like they're winning, as you said. They threw everything. And so what, was, what went around the thinking of Nixon's decision to then escalate? You want to take that? Well, I think, uh, well, it was very important. It was a very important weekend. It was, uh, he did it on the 8th of May. And so in the preceding days, we uh, had some meetings. I remember General Haig calling me in uh, on a Friday afternoon. I was about to go to New York. And he said, you better stick around. The president's decided. It's a certainty that he's going to mine uh, Haiphong and bomb Hanoi. Uh, we're going to spend the weekend here doing some staff work, and then we'll have an NSC meeting on Monday. And he asked me to write a kind of a justification mm -hmm. for doing this. And then now, what was, the, what was the background in mining Haiphong Harbor? It was the largest harbor in, in well, North I mean, Vietnam. Well, and it it's the, the kind of escalation that we'd avoided previously. Mm -hmm. But I think Mr. Nixon felt that, and uh, he felt that. He, he couldn't go to Moscow on his summit with Mr. Brezhnev while Mr. Brezhnev's client was invading a friend of ours. He with had, Russian weapons. Exactly. So he had to take some firm action. That was really the, the nub of it. And so we had an NSC meeting that Monday morning, and then, uh, and then the action was undertaken. And it, uh, it continued. It continued. about it those continued. five or six days then? So the decision, President Nixon decided we were going to bomb Hanoi, right. mine Haiphong Harbor, knowing that maybe the Moscow summit hung, hung in the balance. Mm -hmm. So what did Kissinger talk to you? What did he say to you to get your right? Well, advice? I'll pass this back okay. to, to okay. Winston, except to say that, yes, on Saturday, that Saturday, we had a meeting in the Situation Room with uh, all of Henry's closest staff. Now, we may have different memories of people's positions, but. I think most people are in favor of doing this, both for military reasons, to, to blunt the North Vietnamese offensive. And they understood Nixon's view that you don't go to Russia looking weak while your American soldiers are getting killed by Russian weapons. Uh, but I, as I recall it, and you correct me with your memory, almost everybody thought this would mean the end of the Moscow summit, that the Russians wouldn't greet Nixon in Moscow when he's bombing and mining. <laughs> Their Essentially, allies. their ships. Their, well, also yeah, their well ships one of their ships got hit by accident, which didn't help. <laughs> it's, uh, if people didn't thought the summit would be either canceled or at least said it's a very good chance it's going to be canceled, I distinctly remember Nixon saying, "No, the Russians have too much at stake with us bilaterally, and they'll go ahead despite this, and I'll look much better being strong as I go there." Whereas others felt. Okay, we should do this, but let's, we're going to lose the arms control agreement, Berlin agreement, all the other things we worked out meticulously with the Russians. Mm -hmm. I remember going in a helicopter with Henry up to Camp David to help write the speech announcing uh, Hanoi and Haiphong. I'm sure John contributed to the speech as this well. This was this couple of days yeah, in early yeah. May. And I said to myself, and, and Henry and I were depressed on the aircraft, not that we were against what was going to happen, but that all our work on the Russian front was going to go down the tubes. Nixon was right, we were wrong, uh, and uh, we went ahead with the summit even while this was happening. Now, some people we ought to let John, excuse me, but John ought well, to tell us what happened. Well, we do have slightly different yeah. recollections of the Saturday what? meeting. I felt that there were more opinions expressed to the effect that the summit is not likely to be canceled, including right. from Helmut Sonnenfeld, who was the European director, and John Holdridge, uh, who was uh, Asia. the Asia Man, but be that as it may, I recall I also attended the NSC meeting on Monday, and I recall Henry saying uh, that he thought there was a 50 50 chance that they would cancel. So Kissinger the summit. took the, the, the small inner circle, yeah. uh, took you into the White House Situation Room, and said, This is what the president's decided. What do you think? Or Yeah, basically, yeah. And what do you think is going to happen? Well, he also consulted us before the president decided. Right. I mean, uh, but then he was also getting views yeah. of what the impact would be. So. But Nixon never wavered then. I, I think this no, is an interesting he, this point. This was a very courageous decision. And yeah. he was willing to risk the Moscow summit, which meant so much to him. 
but in his mind, he wasn't risking it that much uh, compared to the most right. of us. Anyway. So when people go back and say, well, is it Kissinger, was it Nixon, this the golden Nick age of American This was Nixon this supported was Nixon. by Kissinger. You know. It, it's very hard sometimes to distinguish the two. Yeah. I want to add one thing on China. Uh, when Kissinger went to China on the secret trip, he took me with him, which rather surprised me because I was not working on China. Wynn was. And nonetheless, uh, you know, when Henry asks you to do something, you do it. <laughs> and so I went. And the interesting thing about it to me was that at a certain point, Zhou Enlai began talking about Vietnam. And he mentioned a number of key points. And afterwards, Kissinger asked me, is there anything in his key points which deviates in a, substantive, in a substantial way from what Le Duc Tho and the Vietnamese are saying? And I said, no. He is taking exactly the same line. To me, that meant that we could not count on the Chinese to pull our irons out of the fire on Vietnam. Well, I would and slightly I think disagree with and that. And I think, I think yeah. that was a key point. Well, I, we, we couldn't, they wouldn't pull our irons out of the fire. But I, I would have a little more nuance than that. First of all, Joe and I has to send his transcript to Hanoi. So yeah, he's that's done, right. Uh, and secondly, I do think, and it was shown by the South African efforts, that they weren't going to pull our irons out of the fire. But to the extent, as I said earlier, they could get us out of Vietnam and, out and away from their borders in a way that wouldn't undercut our world credibility and balancing of the, of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It was worth it for the, I think they did argue to Hanoi, don't make them overthrow to you, settle for a military settlement. You get it, your prize in the long run. That would be the only nuance. Yeah, yeah that, that was uh, an important modification. Yeah. I appreciate that. Okay, and then so let's flash forward. That was, that was talking about Vietnam with the Chinese and um, several months, a yeah. year before. We, but then when you went to Moscow, yeah. did you also talk to the... Yeah, we... Well, okay, so, so Nixon well, was Moscow, right. Moscow was a very different kettle of fish. So Nixon called the bluff. The t trip was on. The Russians, the Soviet Union did not object. Everything went according right. to schedule. Now you're in so, Moscow. So we have one seminal meeting on Vietnam with Brezhnev, Podgorny, Kosygin, their Alexandrov. Alexandrov, their national security advisor and, and their interpreter, and then it was... And the two of you were in that meeting. And then it was meeting. Nixon, it was the president, it was Henry, and it was Winston and, and myself. And we had a nice, long, four-hour thing where they basically vented uh, about Vietnam. I, I think it, the longer they spoke, the clearer it was that they were... They, it's, again, this question of sending the transcript to Hanoi. <laughs> they, were the, they were doing this for the record in in Hanoi, and uh, uh, well, Winston may want to talk a bit about the, well, the one detail. Yeah, there's <laughs> one of the worst moments of my life <laughs> up to then was the fact that Negroponte and Lord missed the presidential motorcade for this meeting. <laughs> this meeting was clearly just going to be on Vietnam. It was going to be at Brezhnev's Dacha, about an hour and a half out of Moscow. There was a big signing ceremony, I think, for a space agreement. I don't know what it was. And we were with the briefing books for the meeting for Nixon and Kissinger in the office. The motorcade is supposed to go a half hour later. Brezhnev says to Henry, <clears throat> let's go out, and to the president, I mean, and let's, uh, to both of them, let's go out to my Dodger early. So the motorcade takes off, and we're left behind with the briefing, briefing books. books. Now, Henry's a great guy, but he can get a little upset when things don't go well. And not having his briefing books, <laughs> not, and Nixon not having his briefing books, and I'm missing the motorcade, even though it was totally not our fault, but that's totally <laughs> irrelevant, right? You know, whose fault it is. Uh, so we were agonizing. We, of course, went to the KGB and said, please let us go out. They said, no, security, you can't go out. So we were an hour and a half behind uh, Brezhnev and Nixon. And as we went out, I think we were contemplating suicide. I don't know about you. <laughs> so we get out there. Luckily, Brezhnev took uh, Nixon out on a boat, and so we didn't miss anything. Then we had the meeting that John, it was a vicious meeting, and Nixon just stood there. He didn't try to debate. And by the way, this is important that the, the fact the Russians had Nixon while we were bombing Hanoi and mining Haiphong must have sent a pretty strong message to Hanoi about how reliable their patron was. So it was quite useful. But after this meeting, very vicious atmosphere, we go upstairs, the entire mood changes, they break out the vodka, and we all sit around and get semi-drunk and have a great time. And then at the end of that, Nixon 
uh, leaves, Kissinger leaves, Kissinger goes off and negotiates the SALT agreement about midnight that night. I don't think he was drunk. And I want to make sure <laughs> no, it was a very good agreement. But He didn't but, really drink in those. Now, Henry, Henry used to say the trouble with my staff is that they are all incompetent. That's right. <laughs> yeah. and, that was, and it was that, example number one. They missed that the was a, they missed Example the number one. I want to let the history <laughs> let, let history know that in the audience are several key members of Henry Kissinger's staff: Phil O'Dean, Les Janka. They course. were chuckling when Winston Lord and John Negroponte yeah. talked oh. about contemplating suicide because Henry Kissinger would have been disappointed at their That's foolish right. actions. Well, Henry was very, was Nixon very magnanimous. Plus, they didn't need briefing books because it was a total four-hour lecture by the other side. So. Well, all right. Now we've got we've gotten through the salt negotiations, arms control agreements, you're opening to China, the Vietnam War is still raging, college campuses are on fire, Smizer's at Harvard incognito and not letting anybody know who you had worked for, and then October 1972 breakthrough. Well, we went back to, we got the North Vietnamese attention with the Haiphong Hanoi and blunting their offensive. Uh, and as you'll see in a later episode, when you're tough with Hanoi, you do get their attention. When you're nice to them, you don't get their attention, unfortunately. So September, we resumed late September talks with the uh, North Vietnamese secret. And we began to get a few inklings that they might be a little bit more flexible even on the political settlement. Nothing definitive, but it was the tone was totally different because we would just bomb the hell out of them, frankly. Plus, we had this very forthcoming proposal still on the table. Uh, to make a long story short, the breakthrough came on October 8, 1972. And why did it come? The breakthrough being the following. We go to another secret talk, and they present a proposal, elaborating on our seven points with their own, of course, proposal. And for the first time in the history of the negotiations, they dropped their political conditions. And people have to remember that. We, up until then, even in 1969, if we just said, give us our prisoners back and we'll get out, it wouldn't have worked. Because they would insist on overthrowing two before they would give us our prisoners. Madam Bin, their foreign minister, had a public proposal sometime during this period, eight points, which basically said, unilateral US withdrawal, uh, and then uh, overthrow two, I mean, not those words, but effectively that. And then once you've done those two things, we'll begin to discuss prisoners. That was their, their position. So anyway, in October, what happened? The US presidential election happened. George McGovern was the opponent to Nixon. He basically was ready to give to the Vietnamese everything they wanted. So as long as they thought McGovern might win, they were going to wait. That's why they petered out the negotiations. And they were going to wait to, to see uh, if he could give them what they wanted without this madman. Mm -hmm. When they saw by October that Nixon was going to win, and probably in a landslide, they said, oh my god, we're going to have this madman in office four more years. He doesn't have to worry about getting reelected. He just bombed the hell out of us. You know, We better make a deal now. That is what turned the tide. Secondly, wrongly, they thought Nixon would be eager, even though he's going to win anyway, eager to have a peace agreement before uh, the election, if he possibly could. Therefore, he might be more flexible. Mm -hmm. Nixon was just the opposite. He was damned if he was going to have any agreement that looked like a sellout just to get reelected. He had a man of principle, and he wasn't going to do it, and he didn't need it for the election. Although the October date is kind of an interesting coincidence compared to the experience four years before. I mean, one of the things I've learned from the Vietnam negotiations is if you can at all avoid it, don't negotiate something critical to United States national security one month before a presidential right. election. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And, and so critics uh, could say that we rushed it. And John might have, you know, he may want to comment on that as we get further on. Uh, but in any event, we spent three days, exhausting days, uh, fleshing out our counterproposal. I remember one night, John, we were staying, I guess, at the embassy. I don't know where we were at that point, because uh, this was pro public now. And Henry said, take their proposal and redo it. So John and I stayed up until 3 AM, did the proposal. Henry woke us up. He was generous that night. He didn't wake us until about 7 AM, I think. <laughs> so he wakes us up and says, this is too tough. I think that's probably Necroponte's fault. I don't know whose fault it was. But in any event, he said, it's too tough. We've got to loosen this up a little bit. So we redid it. Anyway, we had three or four more exhausting days. 
and we finally settled on the basics of an agreement. There's some details. And Henry was asked to go to Hanoi to complete it. And he was contemplating that. Meanwhile, we were keeping Nixon and President Hugh informed, but rounding off some of the edges, not to scare anybody or lock us in. Uh, and so we went back to the agreement. I stayed behind for a day with our translator, and I negotiated with the Vietnamese on a, a, a lot of details. We made about 65, 70 technical changes. I'm not pretending I was a major negotiator, but it was still harrowing. I thought we had succeeded. I went to bed, and I was woken up by a phone call from Haig the next morning, saying, you've got to go back to North Vietnamese and get some more points. So anyway, we, we fl I flew back on a commercial airline. I can still remember it. You've got to remember the emotions of this time. I went into the restroom on the plane and sat down and cried, uh, both out of exhaustion and out of joy uh, that yeah, we were going to end this damn thing. But then we got back to Washington, and uh, we decided we better go tell Mr. Tu what this agreement's all about. And I'll let John pick it up from there. Well, then we went to Saigon. I think it was about the 17th of, of October. And the scenario that Henry had in mind was we'd go to Saigon for a couple of days, and then we would go to Hanoi, initial the agreement, and then the ceasefire would go into effect, I think, on the 2nd of November, something like that. So just several days before the elections. But we, uh, when we got to Saigon, unfortunately, we didn't even have yet a, a, a fully completed Vietnamese uh, text, um, but Thiel reacted. I was not at the meeting with Thiel. Maybe you on were. On John's behalf, I'm going to interrupt you for your sake. On the way out there, we had discussions on the plane about how Thiel is going to react. Henry and I, partly analysis, partly wishful thinking, thought he would not like the agreement, but he would accept it because we got rid of the political condition that he'd be overthrown. He'd still be in office. And in fact, a year before, we had elaborated one of our proposals by saying we're willing to have elections after an agreement. We said this in North Vietnamese, six months after agreement under international supervision, including communist participants in the international body. And the two would resign a month before the elections. Uh, but we leave the implication that he would still run in the elections. Mm -hmm. He was willing then, this was a year earlier, to actually say, no, I won't even run in the elections. He said, no, that's going too far. Yeah. So he was very forthcoming there. So for that reason, we thought he might buy this agreement. Plus, as I say, uh, there were many other reassurances of continuing aid and everything else. John was much more prescient. Uh, he predicted a, a, a real blow up in Saigon. I'll let you pick. I just want to make So you point. think you got a deal after a decade of yeah. the Vietnam War, and then you go to Well, South yeah, Vietnam. I mean, there's not much more to the story. Then what happens is Thieu says he won't do it. Uh, then the North Vietnamese reveal the fact, of, and Henry then cancels his trip to Hanoi to carry out this scenario. Arnaud de Bourgrave at that time uh, writes a story which is headlined in Newsweek magazine, a deal with Hanoi, a duel with Thiel, and uh, President Nixon, faced with this situation, decides, I think very correctly, that he couldn't go ahead and forge ahead and sign this agreement in October uh, of 72, it would look like we were really in a very ungracious way just dumping uh, an ally who we'd fought side by side with for all, all these years. So we decided to go back to Washington. And Henry had a press conference on the 26th of October. If First you, press conference he ever gave. Yeah. Memory yeah. serves. Yeah. And said, uh, peace is at hand, and which was misinterpreted by many of the critics as Henry trying to convince the American people that, uh, uh, you know, to try to deceive them somehow. Whereas what he was really trying to do was to send a message reassuring uh, Hanoi, particularly in my view, and, and a message to Saigon also to say, okay, we've had this hiccup, but we're going to be back to sort this out after the election. That's right. So then you have Nixon's reelected. You don't have a deal. Then what does Nixon do? Well, we go back with more talks in November in Paris, which got nowhere. Not only did the North Vietnamese not make some changes. We said we had to. When it blew up uh, with Hanoi, we said, look, we've always told you all along we can't do this deal unless South Vietnam is on board. And they're not. We need to make a few changes. Mm -hmm. But as John said, we kept reassuring them the base agreement was in place. And we're <laughs> reassuring or telling. Two, that we're going to try to get some of your changes, but don't expect too much. We're going to stick with this. So we go back, nothing happens in November. 
So that gets us to... Uh, Although all, the, all along, just to interrupt, sure. uh, uh, all along we have now decided to really ramp up the supply of the South Vietnamese right. Army so that to bolster their sense of security right. for any future agreement we might go into. That's right. We were telling to we would, you know, back them up and uh, anyway, we'd get into that. Nixon decides, once again, the only way to get the North Vietnamese attention is some military pressure. So you have the famous Xmas Christmas bombing. It literally took place around Christmas time, since the November talks got nowhere. Now, the fact is, you could argue it's not a nice thing to do. The fact is, within two days, the North Vietnamese <coughs> sent us a conciliatory note saying they wanted to talk again, so we got their attention. Furthermore, there, we really did limit civilian casualties. There are all kinds of horror stories about all these civilian casualties. I'm sure there was, quote, collateral damage, but we did our best to minimize it. And when we went to Hanoi later, a couple months later, we could see that in the populated areas there were no, there was no damage. The craters were out in areas that were not near the uh, population. So uh, in any event, that got their attention. We went back to negotiations. They did make some changes, not enough for two's sake, uh, but we got the deal. Uh, so and two we days signed, after the Christmas and bombing, we, signed, we got the deal. We have a deal. picture of the uh, initialing ceremony uh, that took place at that point, uh, January 23rd, 1972. But wh why don't you, uh, do you want to add something to it? Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm... So this is the initialing ceremony. Right. right. And, You're and then, in, where is this taking place? This is in Paris. In and Paris. It, do you want to talk us through? And then there's the International Conference Center where there's a picture later on of uh, Leto To and Henry and others mm -hmm. coming out onto the streets. It's on Avenue Clébert of... Uh, <laughs> Well, Paris, France. There go you go. Back to, can you go back to the previous picture? I can explain who's in the picture. Yeah. On the left-hand side, the, uh, Ambassador Sullivan, who was negotiating along with the legal advisor of State Department, to Kissinger's left, uh, to, to George Aldrich. Yeah. George Aldrich. They were negotiating some protocols in Indochina, generally prisoners and supervision. So you have Sullivan, Kissinger, Aldrich, uh, then myself, and then a dawa-looking uh, John Negroponte. <laughs> who was less happy, I think, with the agreement than I was. Uh, and then our translator, Angle. And then uh, opposite from Henry is late October, the white hair, to his right, Zwan Twee. By the way, in our negotiations, whenever late October showed up, he was number five in that Politburo. We knew it was going to be fairly serious. If it was just Zwan Twee, who was a functionary and a vice minister of foreign affairs, we knew it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So that's who is on the other side, along with their uh, foreign minister to later. And in that right. conversation, I recall one thing that Henry asked later to, which I thought was quite revealing. He said, uh, do you decide these issues in the Politburo uh, by consensus <laughs> or by vote? And I was sure he was going to say by consensus, because that's sort of the way the communists work. At least it, that's my perception of things. And he said, no, by vote, which I thought was pretty interesting. And I think they had actually genuinely been divided in the weeks pre preceding mm -hmm. about whether or not to go forward with the agreement because they felt they'd been double crossed by, by us bailing out in the, on the, the original scenario and then resupplying Saigon with all this equipment. I think there was some, might have been some dissension in the Politburo about whether to go forward or not, which is why he then, just before Christmas, uh -huh. said he had to go back. And I think the reason he introduced so many, he introduced a, a whole bunch of changes, nine or 10 changes in the agreement just before we finished the November, December talks. And I think it was to buy himself time to go back for consultations. I didn't, I don't think he realized he was gonna also buy the Christmas bombing. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so the deal is signed January, 1973. What happens next? Next is Kissinger goes to Hanoi and we were with him. Uh, I was not. I, oh, you were not? I that. declined to go. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I was with him. And uh, several purposes. One, to try to urge implementation faithfully by the Hanoi of the agreement and to both threaten and reassure them about implementation, of, uh, whether to do that. Secondly, very importantly, to get as much information on prisoners of war as we could. Very important issue. Mm -hmm. In the agreement, we... we we insisted, this was crucial for Nixon and Kissinger throughout, was the prisoner situation. We insisted we had to have them all back, and they had to come back while we were still in the country. So the agreement phased over two months, incremental U.S. withdrawals and incremental return of prisoners. And we got them all back on schedule. They did live up to that, 
Uh, but the problem is that the, the list they gave us of prisoners they were returning was shorter than we thought it should have been. And it was very weak on Laos and Cambodia prisoners. And so one of the purposes of this trip was to try to get more information. And we even brought photos of those who we thought should be in the prison camps, but they hadn't returned. We, it was a very unproductive trip, unfortunately, foreshadowing what was coming. And the question, of course, remained for many years that they hold prisoners back. My view is they were certainly brutal enough to do this, but they didn't do it. Because if you hold them back and you don't tell anybody you've got them, it, it doesn't give any leverage. Mm -hmm. And if they tell the world that they reneged and they held these people back, uh, then, of course, there's a world outrage. Uh, my guess is that those who we thought should have been on the list probably died in captivity under torture or starvation or whatever it is, and they didn't want to reveal that fact. I think we got everyone back who they actually had at that point. So the prisoners are back, the deal is signed, you're all relieved that we've actually finally ended the Vietnam War and we've done it with honor and integrity and decency, but then it all falls apart. Well, I think John, to be honest here, I think John was a little bit less relieved than I was. I mean, you, you have a right. Did you know, uh, yeah. when, when the deal was done, did you, know, did you think, okay, yeah, no, this I is didn't, great? No, I did not like the deal, I, and I foresaw in that agreement the seeds of uh, what happened uh, next. I think in, in honesty, it was a withdrawal agreement. You know, we, some, in diplomacy, sometimes you use euphemistic terms for what it is you've done. I mean, if you look at the agreement, it's called the agreement to restore uh, uh, to, to restore peace, uh, to end the war and restore peace in Vietnam. Well, it wasn't really that. It turned out essentially to be a withdrawal agreement. Uh, and uh, the interval ended up not being quite as decent as we would have liked it to be. And then, of course, there, there's all kinds of discussion afterwards of what, did it unravel because of the agreement or did it unravel because the presidency was so weakened uh, in those subsequent Gate. years that it deprived President Nixon of his ability to react and respond in a forceful way. And, well, you know, we can, we can dis debate the what-ifs right. forever. Let, let me explain what Nixon and Kissinger's view were, which yeah. I shared, mm -hmm. somewhat a difference with, with John, and reasonable people can disagree yeah. on this. First, we felt that we had, for 10 years, sacrificed blood and money on behalf of South Vietnam. So we have done so much to help them. And we tried to prepare them with Vietnamization. We paid our price. Secondly, we honestly felt it was the best deal we could possibly get. It was better than most people predicted. Most yeah. editorials and peace people were saying, coalition government, get rid of Thieu, and so on. We, we avoided that, thinking we'd give at least a chance for him to survive. There were four reasons we thought the agreement would hold up beyond thinking we were out of time in any event, that you know, we'd just gone on long enough. Number one, if they were, we well, were not naive. We didn't trust Hanoi. So if they nibbled uh, at the agreement and had some ceasefire violations, we felt that the South Vietnamese, uh, with our supplies, would be able to handle that, that they'd gotten to the point they can handle low-level violations. Number two, if there was massive infiltration and invasion, which did happen, we thought that the American people, certainly we didn't want, and they didn't want us to go back in on the ground, but to, to uphold an agreement after all these sacrifices and credibility as a world power, at least resume our bombing to stop them from invading. Mm -hmm. uh, so we thought the military situation could be manageable. Thirdly, there was an aid program. They wanted to call it reparations. We called it reconstruction. And we had aid programs for Laos, Cambodia, and South Vietnam, as well as Hanoi. So that was an incentive. That was the carrot to Hanoi. I think it was two and a half billion dollars. If they implement the agreement, they get all this aid for reconstruction. And uh, fourthly, we thought that the Chinese and the Russians would weigh in on implementation, not wanting to humiliate us and having their own stakes in the bilateral relationship. Now, each of those assumptions didn't really pan out. Uh, the South Vietnamese were not as capable as we hoped. But in all fairness, the Congress, to its eternal shame, cut off economic and military aid, or at least military aid, to the South Vietnamese. So the, the, the practical and the psychological impact on our allies of trying to fight off a North Vietnamese invasion when we wouldn't even give them military aid. We're not talking about boots on the ground or even air power. Uh, and of course, we couldn't do air power. Uh, and when did Congress cut off aid? Was it any one time? or? Well, it, was, it, it got more and more 
incremental about cutting off bombing, cutting off aid. I don't have all this chronological But this was 1973, Well, it was started in 72 and 3, I mean, and 4, you know, it kept on going. And the archives would have the, the details. And I must say, Kissinger's book, this is the most uh, comprehensive account, obviously from his perspective, of everything we've talked about and a lot more. So I would, those who are interested in, yeah. this came out in 2003. It's called Ending the Vietnam War. So, uh, but that too I, is a euphemism, if you pardon the interruption. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it ended our involvement in the Vietnam War. Yeah. I mean, that's the more accurate yeah, statement. Yeah, that's right. So that's why we think it could have worked, but it didn't work because some of these assumptions uh, proved, mm -hmm. proved to be wrong. Now, the way we got two to go along was the kind of rationale I just told you. And of course, we couldn't back up, as well as threats. We were out of patience. It's time to come to an agreement. Uh, and he, of course, objected not only to the fact that there were North Vietnamese in his country, but also he felt he'd been misled about where we were and that we dumped it on him just before our elections. So that's why he reacted the way he did. And he didn't like it two months later uh, either. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we thought it could work, why we felt that we wouldn't get a better deal. Uh, and uh, it didn't work out, obviously, the way we hoped. Uh, but the fact is we did buy some time uh, Southeast Asia had time to uh, assemble itself and not fall as dominoes, uh, but it was purchased uh, at a very uh, tough price. So by April 1975, North Vietnam moved into Saigon, and we evacuated the American embassy in Saigon. Right. Are there any final thoughts about all of this? I'm going to get Dick back in here. Uh, final thoughts? What did we the, learn from you, Vietnam? What were the successes? What were the failures? What do you take away as the lessons the nation should learn? I think the main lesson is don't get involved in things where you cannot count on your public being fully committed. Because our problem, and I want to stress this again. I've said it before, but I want to stress it again. Our problems were not only in Vietnam. Our problems were in the United States. For some odd reason, and maybe some not so odd reason, we were unable to convince the American people that there was a genuine American stake in this conflict. And why we were not able to convince them, what that meant to them, and how we could have done it is one of the great questions of the century. And I suspect that your book does not fully answer it. And I'm not sure that anybody can fully answer it. But I teach a course in diplomacy at, George, at the Georgetown University. And one of the things I go into, not in the kind of painstaking detail that we do here, but one of the things I go into is the question of how does one handle the problem of public opinion in a democracy when you're dealing with a diplomatic situation. And when you're dealing with people who are smart and as dedicated as the North Vietnamese turned out to be, you have a genuine problem. And you cannot solve it simply by glib memos and sending papers around and taking a lot of trips. You have to solve it by convincing people that what is at stake is genuinely in the national interest. And there were times when we were able to do this, and there were times when we were not able to do that. And I think that is the real question that the Americans face in the coming years and in the coming century, because we have a very, very difficult situation in terms of projecting power across the world in a very, very complex environment. And that is what we have to learn to do. I think if there's anything that comes to me out of this discussion, and I think John and Wynne have handled it brilliantly, if you pardon my saying so, and you asked exactly the right question. The real issue is how does one manage public opinion in a democracy in such a way that one doesn't cheat people? Don't ever think for a moment that you can cheat them, because you can't. You have to do it honestly. You have to do it honorably. But you also have to do it right. And it is one of the questions which I address with my students. How in God's good earth can you sometimes do this? And I hate to say that, but 
even though, of course, it's an excellent and brilliant course managed by a wonderful professor, <laughs> we don't have the answer in this course. And I'm not sure that anybody does. Your students even know anything about Vietnam. I would think it's ancient history to them. It's, it's ancient history to them, but they can be introduced to the elements of difficulty that we had. And it is a difficult thing to do particularly when you're dealing with somebody who is as clever and as motivated as the Vietnamese were, and still perhaps are. Now they have a different problem with the Chinese, but that, I'm happy to let them worry. Uh, it is, however, something that I think is, needs a total commitment of American thought and conscience how we continue this. Because well said. The, the world is not going to get simpler. No. And there we are. Well said. John, what are your final thoughts? Well, uh, several things. <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, first of all, it, uh, my con that was more or less the beginning of my career, not the end of it. And, uh, yes. Yeah. So I went on, and I ended up dealing with situations like Iraq and Afghanistan. I was ambassador to Iraq, and so I ca in Central America. I was uh, I was in a lot of different conflictive situations. So I carried my recollections uh, of Vietnam with me uh, wherever I went. And and I suppose one of the most important things was Vietnamization and the fact of building local, the Guam Doctrine, building local capacity, the whole issue of, of uh, you know, can we do it all ourselves? Can we be the policemen of the world or do we have to have friends in this endeavor? So I always have, ever since Vietnam, emphasized this aspect. I remember sitting in my office as ambassador of the United Nations with George Tenet when he was head of CIA and we'd just gone in to Afghanistan and I told him, we've got to build up the Afghan army. And he just sort of shrugged it off. I mean, we didn't try to do that for another six or seven years, which I think is really unfortunate. So I hope we don't have to keep relearning this lesson when we want to try to help other countries uh, in difficult situations. The second thing I'd, uh, I'd say is that uh, Obviously, what ensued from this, or, and, and I think we need to be fair to Mr. Nixon and Mr. Kissinger, even though they're the ones who ended it, they, they don't really get responsibility. You can't just tag them with responsibility for everything that went before, because I think, in fact, their strategy was quite brilliant, and it would have been better if we'd applied it even sooner. For example, I think the entire LBJ administration they never really thought through the implications of the Sino-Soviet split, uh, which, which I think Henry and, and, and President Nixon did very thor thoroughly, obviously. And lastly, to, sort of on a, uh, a happy note, despite the loss of Vietnam to the north, despite the, all the human tragedy that ensued for boat people, Vietnamese who migrated here, and so forth, um, I found it very interesting when I went back as Deputy Secretary of State, first time in, that I'd been back to Vietnam in 35 years since the signing of the agreement, and just saw the incredible enthusiasm that existed in the uh, Democratic Republic of Vietnam for good relations uh, for the United States. And I think it's mutual. And I, I remember leaving uh, Hanoi, and I gave a press conference, as I would always do whenever I made an official stop somewhere. And a, a, Vietnamese journalist asked me, Mr. Ambassador, uh, if uh, an American oil rig was attacked by the Chinese in a, a Vietnamese uh, controlled waters, would the United States uh, come to our assistance? Well, you know, when you think of that, could you, uh, that such a question was even conceivable into, uh, uh, you know, back 40 years ago. It, we've, we've come a long way, and I, I find it heartening that we've actually uh, come back to having a healthy relationship with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Well, I think what we've just said is what I think it was Tyler Randall said, but someone can correct me, that you don't have permanent friends or permanent enemies, you have permanent interests. And we have come full circle with Vietnam, I and mean, we might come full circle again. Uh, the fact is, just a few years after the Paris Peace Agreement, uh, the Chinese invaded uh, Vietnam. And they had real conflicts over Cambodia and all kinds of things. Uh, 
for me personally, uh, it was the beginning of my career, all of us were pretty young then. And uh, when I was assistant secretary under Clinton in the early 1990s, we were very consumed with the MIA question, who was still missing, getting remains back. So the president appointed me and the deputy head of the Veterans Administration, Herschel Goldberg, co-chair of a presidential commission. We took several trips to Hanoi. You can imagine the memories I had to try to find out more about the missing and get the remains. We made a lot of progress, and one of the most emotional and moving moments of my life would be to stand in the Hanoi airport, and it was out of our efforts to see uh, coffins going back to the United States with remains of people who didn't know where their loved ones were for 15 or 20 years. Uh, we decided that we would move ahead to try to normalize relations with <coughs> Vietnam. And for me, it was holding my nose because I, these guys had broken the agreement and all the sacrifices we had made. But I felt, but more importantly, the administration felt that was the best way to get information on the MIAs. Secondly, it would be, help to balance China, which was growing as a geopolitical competitor, because Vietnam, we cleared by then, was not a great friend of China. Thirdly, we'd have more influence in Southeast Asia. And eventually, Vietnam's an important country, a lot of people in it. Economically, it might be useful down the road. And with the help of people like Senator McCain and Senator Kerry, now foreign minister and head of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, and Senator Bob Kerry and a congressman named Pete Peterson, they protected Clinton's flank to go ahead with normalization because Clinton was vulnerable having evaded the draft. So these war heroes and prisoners of war stood up for normalization. And we then normalized relations in 1996. And then they, since led the then, way. they led the way, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But Clinton had to go ahead, yeah. and he had the cover. So then we normalized, and then we have what John says, the now situation in the South China Sea where Vietnam's not going to become our ally. But they do see the need for reassuring American presence in that region, as do all the other countries of the region. If, so I, could add my, if I could add my final thoughts, I have two. One, the debate that we've had, you could have today about the foreign policy of the United States today and the place of, the, of America in the world. We're still talking about a lot of the same issues, public support for what's increasingly unpopular war. Do you go back in and bomb if someone uh, does not abide by the agreement? What happens to safe havens across borders? These are all the same issues we're facing today. But the other thing I must conclude with is, as I listen to the three of you, talking about with enormous depth and feeling and concern and integrity and honesty and no naivete and the way you helped conduct foreign policy during a period of enormous crisis in the United States, constitutional crisis, people on the streets, and dealing with one of the most intractable problems, I really must say it was an honor to serve with such great men. And thank you very much for sharing your perspective with all of us and for putting it down for history, because I think people can learn a lot from what you've done for your nation. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>